Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I will address today the concept of a systematic uh, fundamental arbitrage in equity. I will answer all your questions as, um, uh, as mentioned at the end of the presentation, quantitative or, uh, or qualitative. What I mean by equity fundamental arbitrage is alpha generation resulting from inconsistencies or imbalances between the market value and the equity value of a company. We can measure these imbalances and inconsistencies in reference to a static number or in reference to comparable companies. So if we have a PE ratio, uh, price to earnings ratio above a given uh, threshold, we would deem the stock overvalued. But if one firm's PE ratio is uh, above another firm's uh, PE, uh, then uh, the first stock is deemed uh, uh, more expensive than the second. What we call relative value analysis here is exactly that. It's a peer-to-peer -peer analysis. Now, when I started to work on a similar project 10 years ago at Société Générale, I had just graduated from college, and I had a real obsession with applied mathematics and financial models in general. And uh, I took the components of the S&P 500. I was using FactSet at the time. I'm not promoting FactSet here. Uh, but I had easily over 10 years history. And I thought, uh, now that I had every input I could hope for, everything I need to do is concentrate on theory. And I was, of course, very wrong. And whatever the project, data control is 80% of the job. Now, equity fundamental arbitrage cannot be conceived without a thorough understanding of uh, both the disclosure process and the nature of the firm's financial statements. Any meaningful approach in uh, equity is a pragmatic approach. We need to understand uh, how material information is disclosed, uh, when it is supposed to be disclosed, and how to read it. So if the rules of disclosures are uh, different, uh, data will most likely be different. Uh, equity under IFRS is defined differently from equity under uh, US GAAP. So data integrity has a legal and regulatory aspect here that I explore uh, through um, the accounting treatment of defined uh, benefit pension plans. Once all disclosure rules and market rules are accounted for, I can factor in my own rules to eventually design a systematic strategy. So I'll go through the specifics of the residual income model, as presented by uh, Gebhardt in 2001. And then I will describe the calibration performed by uh, Fama and French. I will discuss a simpler model and a different approach for its calibration, one that is adapted for a relative value uh, analysis. Finally, I will test the robustness uh, of our scorings, discuss briefly uh, the challenges of a small beta allocation, and in the end, uh, challenge the results. So throughout this presentation, I will complete uh, the strategy's profile, uh, its objectives and constraints. You can see here, uh, we have the two standard objectives of return and risk, and four investment constraints, time horizon, liquidity constraints, legal and regulatory, and unique circumstances. Uh, that are really specific to equity shares. So far, I have my return objective of uh, consistent alpha generation through statistical analysis of financial statements and uh, data uh, in general. So let's fill in some uh, more of the, of the investment constraints first. Trading stocks requires uh, rigor. Uh, especially if you are engaging in uh, long, short, or market neutral strategies. Execution is an essential part of the process. Well, good news first, uh, brokerage fees and transaction uh, fees in general have dropped uh, by half these last few years, uh, due mostly to an increasing competition among uh, brokers and prime brokers. But anyone who has traded stocks or stock derivatives knows that trend-following uh, strategies can suffer high implicit costs, high slippage costs. A trader can spend hours chasing a price, and in the end, these costs might offset uh, any expected benefit. So designing liquidity provider uh, strategies rather than, um, uh, than trend-following strategies is 
always a better option when dealing with uh, stocks. And by liquidity provider strategies, I mean mean reverting uh, strategies. <clears throat> we also know that shorting a stock uh, close to a corporate action or right after an IPO can be highly expensive. Not to say sometimes impossible. Uh, borrow costs can persist at high levels, uh, sometimes more than 50%, uh, months after an IPO. Uh, the, the recent uh, Groupon or Facebook uh, IPOs are, are proof of that. And there was an extraordinary high demand for these stocks. But in current markets and in standard market conditions, more than 90% of the total return uh, swaps imply borrow costs significantly below 2%. We also have uh, legal constraints uh, generating market imperfections, such as the optic rule uh, on the Japanese market, uh, or the short selling restrictions on uh, financial stocks in the midst of the crisis in 2008. Sorry. Finally, it's important to consider uh, account margin requirements for an optimized uh, cash management. At best, and here because we are not dealing with uh, event-driven uh, strategies, we should avoid critical firms and low-level stocks uh, that are more exposed to a potential short squeeze. Now, all these market specifics uh, make investors reluctant in operating uh, with equity shares. They are among the reasons why uh, strategies and indices uh, defined as fundamental arbitrage uh, have mostly failed. Now for liquidity, <clears throat> for liquidity uh, constraints, I can fill in here uh, my constraints. I, I'm better off looking at the float uh, or the trading volume uh, rather than the market capitalization. And I am looking for a liquidity provider strategy uh, rather than a mean reverting uh, strategy. Uh, for unique circumstances, uh, we should pay attention to borrow costs and account margin requirements. We should also avoid critical firms and speculative stocks. Now, note that I entitled the first uh, subsection a controlled disorder uh, for all the reasons that I have mentioned so far and for more reasons that I will mention uh, later. I will try to bring some measure of control to this disorder and eventually lay out the steps towards uh, a systematic investment solution. Now, apart from market considerations, a large portion of this disorder is explained uh, by the release of material information on earnings announcement dates. And some other portion is explained by unscheduled release of material information, such as profit warnings and results guidance. Now, before playing the game, and it's a large-scale game, over thousands of firms, we absolutely need to go through the rules. We are working on the design of a systematic strategy, and a systematic strategy is based on uh, rules. The existing rules and your own compatible rules. Now, most existing rules are obviously set up by the SEC for the US market and by the relevant authorities in Europe. Now, the first simple rule defines three categories of filers, depending on their public float. A firm with a public float above $700 million uh, will file uh, the annual 10K within the deadline of 60 days after the end of the fiscal year, and the quarterly 10Q uh, reports within 40 days uh, after the end of the quarter. These firms are referred to as uh, accelerated, uh, large accelerated filers. Now, for accelerated filers with a public float below $700 million and above $75 million, uh, <coughs> The firm must file within 75 days uh, for the 10K annual uh, filings and within 40 days from the end of uh, the quarter period. Now, obviously, the SEC applies larger deadlines for lower public floats because the filing deadline is a constraint. And like any constraint, it comes at a cost. A fixed cost that doesn't seem to be justified by the benefits that investors uh, would obtain from earlier access uh, to the reports. I invite you all to read uh, the December 2005 sorry, revisions to the accelerated filer uh, definition and accelerated deadlines for filing periodic reports. You'll find there a complete cost-benefit uh, analysis. 
Now, apart from the 10K and 10Q uh, periodic reports, we have current 8K filings that are more generally produced to disseminate material information to the public in a timely manner. Now, a firm must file the 8K within four business days of the event's occurrence. Now, you can refer to the general instructions uh, included uh, in any 8K, or you can refer to uh, the Code of uh, Federal uh, Regulations, uh, CFR, for all details on uh, reporting requirements. The Code of Federal Regulations lists nine sections that cover 31 items, and each item is a reportable event. Now, among these items, we have a particular interest in uh, item 2.02, .02, results of operations and financial condition, and item 9.01, financial uh, statements and exhibits. Most of the accounting data we need is already disclosed there, within a few business days of the announcement. Now, it is completed by the full quarterly and uh, annual reports available within uh, two months from the end of the quarter period or the end of the fiscal year. Now, gathering what I have mentioned so far, this is how uh, the schedule looks like. It's a simple schedule. Uh, I have the end of period, uh, I have my 8K filed at the announcement date, um, I have the quarterly and annual uh, 10Q and uh, 10K filings at deadlines depending on the firm's uh, float. Now, even though data included in the 8K is sometimes uh, incomplete uh, or limited, it can be completed uh, with information disclosed uh, at the conference call or on the firm's website. Uh, it can also be in the most extreme cases, uh, extrapolated uh, or estimated. I'm thinking of uh, equity and cash flow from operations and so on. Now, why is this so important? We are looking to managing a portfolio of stocks selected among thousands of companies. I would like a practical way for detecting when my data for a company is outdated or when this data is due. So I can actually optimize the decision-making process. I can automate all I can to concentrate my efforts on risk management and execution. Now, so far, if we, if we leave it this way, it's not too bad. Uh, but to spice it up a little bit, there is always, in every game, at least every interesting game, uh, a tricky section uh, to the rules. And this section here is about uh, restatements and reclassifications. Now, financial statements are restated if there is a material inaccuracy in a previous filing. Anyone can make mistakes when filing financial statements. Uh, and this is, of course, accounted for in the rules. Now, in practice, setting up the right uh, filters and warnings could save the day. Uh, this is, after all, a matter of uh, specific or operational uh, risk management. We can take action as soon as the correction becomes uh, public information. Uh, we can even take action immediately for the most obvious uh, mistakes. Now, financial statements are also restated for a change in accounting rules when this change requires a retrospective application. Uh, we have also uh, restatements to account for uh, mergers and spin-offs uh, when the nature and size of uh, the firm might change drastically, uh, in which case the firm uh, should dis disclose a history that is coherent uh, with its business and financial status uh, post-merger or uh, post-spin-off. All restatements and disclosures are included in the uh, 10QA, 10KA and 8KA filings. Now, for discontinued activities, both original statements and restatements are, dis are disclosed in the same filing. Uh, assets related to uh, discontinued activities will usually be uh, reclassified as held for sale. Uh, we will have uh, reclassifications into uh, change in net income from discontinued activities and uh, cash flow from uh, discontinued activities. Now, a quick word on Europe. Uh, we have similar rules for uh, European uh, countries and firms reporting under IFRS. The policy's convergence falls within the jurisdiction of the European Securities and Market Authorities, the ESMA, that was established in Jan 2011. Now, ESMA is also working with the network of uh, officially appointed uh, mechanisms, the OAMs, uh, for the central storage of uh, regulated information. 
Uh, <coughs> I have uh, reported here some uh, deadlines for, sorry, for France, Germany, and Spain for the annual, semi-annual, and quarterly uh, filings. Uh, now, politics aside, uh, the harmonization takes time, like pretty much anything in uh, Europe. Uh, but if we take, <coughs> for the US case at least, if we take everything we've mentioned so far, this is how the final uh, schedule looks like. Now, 8K uh, filings are followed by the filing of uh, periodic reports, uh, the 10Q and 10Ks. If the firm can't file before the deadline, it must notify the SEC through uh, NT10K and NT10Q uh, filings. I have pictured here two periods uh, with the end of period EOP1 and EOP2. On the second period, we might have uh, restatements of uh, previous uh, uh, filings. And we also can have uh, transition reports, the uh, 10QT and uh, 10KT uh, filings, whenever there's a change in the fiscal year. Now imagine thousands of schedules like this one. Uh, one for each reporting firm. Where the end of periods do not necessarily match. Now that's what we can call a controlled disorder. So going back to our objectives and constraints, we can fill in here uh, the legal and regulatory constraints. Uh, I mentioned here systematic compliance to rules and regulations. Now I can hear your minds uh, whispering. Why do we bother looking to the past? Why bother with restatements? After all, I have the firm's guidance, I have a market consensus for earnings, and we all know here that the market is all about expectations. Well, I'd like to raise two questions. First question, how reliable is a firm's guidance for a firm's uh, forward-looking statements, more specifically, uh, when it reflects uh, the short-term horizon? It turns out there is an actual trade-off between uh, short-term uh, transparency that come with lower volatility, lower uh, uncertainty, and the drawbacks of a management that favors fast short-term profit uh, over uh, more profitable uh, long-term uh, projects. The pressure to disclose an exciting guidance for the short term might come at the expense uh, of a long-term performance. Now, we've known for a while that there is no evidence whatsoever of any return upside to shareholders from issuing frequent earnings guidance. And this is why Google, Coca-Cola, Costco do not provide guidance. Uh, more and more are reconsidering the benefits of uh, providing guidance of short-term transparency in general as, as it makes uh, these firms uh, vulnerable to uh, speculators. My second question is, how reliable is the market consensus when the analyst coverage is scarce? I should expect more opportunities uh, on low coverage names. After all, high competition goes with low margin. Low profit margins, sorry. So whenever competition is low, I must try to challenge uh, the so-called consensus. Now overall, I would like an analysis that is free of any consensus bias, free of any limitations due to uh, coverage. I need flexibility in treating new information so I can feel comfortable uh, trading my portfolio, not having to rely on uh, black boxes. And to get there, I need to account for all potential result scenarios. I'm hoping to assign a probability uh, for each scenario, given the firm's uh, current financial health. If a scenario were realized in the past for a different firm, but in the same industry, and with a similar financial health, then I should expect uh, a higher probability to see this same scenario happen again. So I would like my model to learn from the history of uh, comparable firms. In statistical terms, I need a cross-sectional sequential learning model. Uh, sorry. Just uh, one last word. Uh, this, is why, this is why we need clean uh, data. 
<coughs> this is why we need a clean history. And by clean, I mean coherence. I wish to avoid having for a firm uh, both post-merger and pre-merger uh, accounting data in the very same observation. Or using past revenues or predict uh, future earnings, failing to account for any discontinued business. Now, after reading the game rules, it is never a bad idea just to watch a few rounds before uh, taking a seat. So let's review here one case scenario, which is uh, the treatment, uh, the balance sheet treatment to be exact, of defined benefit pension plans. And this is a recent change in accounting policies regarding uh, uh, the IFRS uh, framework. One objective for this amendment is to align the balance sheet effects with those reported under US GAAP, and part of the policy's convergence. Now, the treatment was revised in 2011, and the change was effective last year on uh, Jan 2013. Of course, what makes it interesting here is that this change required retrospective application. Uh, I will quickly explain the basics of accounting. Um, <coughs> A plan is initiated by uh, a contract offered by the firm to its employees. Uh, the firm records on its balance sheet uh, a defined benefit liability or asset, depending on the funded status of uh, the plan. Uh, the defined benefit liability is the present value of, uh, the, of the defined benefit obligations, uh, so the obligations due uh, by the firm uh, towards its employees, uh, mentioned here as DBO, uh, less the fair value of, of the plan's assets. Now you can see here a synthesized uh, pension plan's balance sheet. The fund is legally separate from the firm, uh, uh, and its sole purpose is to fund uh, the employee benefits uh, as specified by the contract. Now, the present value of the DBO depends on various factors. I will just mention uh, two here. The first one is the change in actuarial assumptions used to value the pension plan's uh, liabilities, such as life expectancy or uh, the discount rate. Uh, the discount rate is a discount rate used to, uh, uh, to discount the annuities. Now, the discount rate is typically uh, the implied uh, interest rate of uh, high quality corporate bonds. However, interest assumptions uh, can be revised and this revision will produce uh, an actual gain uh, or loss. Now there is also a dependency on plan amendments when moving from a defined benefit uh, pension plan to a defined contribution plan, a dependency on uh, plan curtailments uh, when there's a significant drop in the number of employees covered by the plan, and so on. Uh, plan amendments and curtailments uh, are defined as past service costs. Now, these two effects can have uh, very large impacts on the DBO. Uh, and if they were directly recognized in the balance sheet, in the firm's liabilities, this could drive the balance sheet's volatility upwards. Uh, so a high uh, volatility in the balance sheet is not something we're looking for. Uh, it could undermine uh, the uh, investor's trust in the reported figures. So before revisions, uh, firms were allowed to record uh, these effects of balance sheets. And the impact was subsequently and slowly recognized uh, as an expense if their cumulative amount exceeded 10% uh, of uh, the plan assets. Now it turns out that many firms were actually deviating from the original purpose of this, uh, of this uh, mechanism and recorded off-balance sheets uh, to delay their losses to equity. And this way, show sure, better financial leverage. Now, the recycling method, and what is uh, referred to as the 10% corridor method, uh, is abolished with the new standards. And since 2013, there is no amortization uh, of actuarial losses or past service costs. These are immediately recognized uh, in equity. Uh, actuarial losses are recorded under a new item called uh, remeasurements in other comprehensive income, and past service costs are recognized in net income. Now take the Daimler case. Daimler has funds asset with a total value of 12 billion euros in 2012. 
Uh, the plan is underfunded. You can see here uh, a negative 9.7 uh, billion for the funded status. It had close to 8 billion of uh, actuarial losses recorded off balance sheets. Uh, they were amortized slowly at a rate of uh, roughly 150 million uh, a year. In 2013, these actuarial losses were reclassified as remeasurements in other comprehensive income, net of taxes, of deferred tax asset to be, to be exact, uh, which amounts to 6 billion uh, euros. It's minus 8 and plus 2 over there. <coughs> So 6 billion euros over 45.5 is roughly 13% of the total equity. Now, furthermore, the new standard uh, removed any amortization of the actual loss that used to be recorded uh, in uh, net income. And this had a positive impact uh, on net profit, 29 uh, minus 13 million for taxes for a total of uh, 16 million uh, profit for the, la for the last quarter of 2012. Now, obviously, after revision, Daniel showed a slightly higher uh, return on equity, a much uh, lower comprehensive income, and a much higher uh, financial leverage. Now, if all ratios were affected equally across firms, my ranking would remain unchanged. Well, it turns out that we have discrepancies across companies, and more certainly, across countries. <clears throat> For example, defined benefit pension plans are more frequent in France and Germany, and defined contribution plans are standard in the US and the UK. The regulations are also different. Germany allows for partial retirement uh, agreements between management and employees, when other European countries don't. So we've discussed the matter of uh, data coherence uh, between uh, countries and firms. We have yet to discuss the matter of data coherence between market and accounting data. <clears throat> well, for example, if you have a Second Republic offering, this Second Republic offering will raise the equity value of a firm and the number of uh, shares outstanding at the same time. So in this case, we would have a PE ratio, a price to earnings ratio that is more or less unchanged, and the return on equity uh, that should be uh, lower. Now, all these incoherencies that I've mentioned so far might have dangerous implications for any systematic analysis. Uh, whenever, uh, for example, trailing ratios uh, are involved, or for the calibration of a regression, if momentums are used as regressors. Now, if we get back to uh, the Daimler case, we have our quarterly observations here piling up. Uh, we need to take four coherent consecutive quarters to uh, analyze uh, our flow data. Flow data consists here of uh, net income, uh, income before extraordinary items, sales, uh, cash flow from uh, operations, any item included in uh, either um, the income statement or the cash flow statement. And these are opposed to uh, stock variables, such as uh, total assets, uh, shareholders' equity, all the items included on uh, the balance sheet. Now, we introduce here the concept of effective date. And we mentioned that restatements are only available as of the beginning of 2013. So March 2013 will be my effective end of period. Uh, so for any information included in the amended filings, this information will be fully available as of March 2013. Now, this means that all the, all the lines highlighted in blue will be our four amended consecutive uh, quarters the four lines that will produce my uh, adjusted data. Now, the concept of effective uh, date will help mitigate any look-ahead bias. It's very useful for uh, simulations. I am only using here um, the information that I can see as of uh, the reference date that I choose, uh, any reference date in the past. <coughs> Uh, 
Now, uh, let's play together and create our own existing rules. I am looking to synthesize both market and accounting values of equity into one single variable, a score for each uh, firm. Uh, the residual income model does so very nicely. The market and accounting information is synthesized into the equity cost of uh, capital. Now, the residual income model supports that uh, the value of uh, the present value uh, of uh, a company equals the present value of uh, the, the current value sorry, of a company equals the present value of future excess earnings over the cost of uh, equity capital. <coughs> now, if we assume all future earnings to be uh, value neutral, uh, starting as soon as next year, which means that the return on equity uh, quickly declines to the cost of equity uh, capital, then the cost of equity will exactly reflect the earnings uh, to price uh, ratio, the earnings yield um, ratio. Uh, <coughs> it is exactly the inverted price to earnings ratio. Now, Gebhardt in 2001 uh, assumes that future excess earnings converge uh, towards a neutral value represented uh, by the industry mean. Now, this convergence is assumed to uh, be achieved in year 12. He predicts the one and two years ahead uh, return on equity and assumes that this return on equity will fade slowly after, linearly, sorry, after the third year towards an industry mean. Now, how far exactly should we predict the firm's earnings? Well, the answer depends on the objective that we hope our model will achieve. And this objective is one or two years ahead uh, forecast of the ranking of uh, our stock performances. Obviously, if I am looking to produce a ranking only uh, within the same industry, I don't really need the model uh, to uh, account for the concept of an industry mean. Uh, I don't need to complexify my model. Now, this is not 100% true, but this is another story. Now, if we look at the uh, earnings residual model uh, through the eyes of Fama and French, this model emphasizes uh, the mutual dependency between the firm's profitability represented by the return on equity. The firm's market value, represented by the price to book ratio, and the firm's propensity for reinvesting its earnings, represented by the equity growth. And these dependencies are reflected by the cost of equity capital, that is here, uh, the required return on equity for a shareholder. Now, the residual income model supports three relationships. The first relationship, holding everything else constant, the required return on equity should increase with profitability. Second relationship, holding everything else uh, constant, the required return on equity should decrease when market value increases. So one on top. And finally, the final relationship is based on the fact that earnings are either uh, reinvested in the firm's uh, project or distributed to shareholders. So increasing the level of reinvestment without any uh, positive prospect on profitability nor market value for the shareholder should drive down the uh, required return on equity. In this case, distributing dividends for the firm uh, should be more uh, uh, for the shareholder, it should be more interesting uh, than uh, reinvesting uh, the earnings. Now we can observe we can observe the equity market value within regular trading hours. Uh, so we will need to predict the return on equity and uh, the growth in the book equity. Now the forecasts are produced by we mentioned it earlier, a cross-sectional model. <coughs> this cross-sectional uh, model uses as factors uh, the earnings quality, profits distribution, revenue, size, uh, operating and financial leverage for uh, all the firms uh, of our universe. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, 
we are going to simplify this model to, uh, to the point where all we need are the one and two years ahead uh, forecast of uh, the return on equity. Uh, I didn't mention it here, but we could use also macro and external factors in our cross-sectional model. So simplifying the setups suggested by uh, Gebhardt, Fama, and French is a luxury that we can afford because we are adopting a relative value approach. If I'm looking uh, to compare firms within the same industry, I need only discriminant factors within this industry. So I choose here to ignore all macroeconomic factors, all external factors that I assume will have a similar impact over the firms uh, of my uh, industry. These firms uh, will belong to the same sector and will abide to the rules and regulations of the same country, at least when it comes to uh, reporting requirements. Now, these are strong assumptions, uh, but still reasonable given what we are expecting from this model, which is an apples to apples relative value analysis for the year ahead. Uh, furthermore, remember that we assumed all earnings to be either reinvested or distributed to uh, shareholders. Now, the clean surplus hypothesis, right here, mentioned, holds that the, the growth of book equity is completely explained uh, by uh, the earnings and the dividends uh, distributed. Now, if we assume, like Gebhardt, that the dividend payout ratio is constant, in the future, then we have the growth of equity that is completely determined by uh, the one and two years ahead uh, return on equity. So as promised, this is what we have left. Uh, one year ahead and two years ahead returns on equity to, to uh, forecast. Now, a word on the calibration. The timing of observations uh, matters if we are considering uh, panel models. Uh, if periods covered uh, by the income and cash flow uh, data were assumed to be exactly the same, perfectly aligned, quarter to quarter, uh, then panel models would be ideal. Now, the major advantage of panel models lies in the detection and treatment of uh, autocorrelations in the error term. Basically, we can theoretically detect whenever the model is better specified as a moving average. Our panel models allow also for the treatment of seasonality. Okay. Now, the perfect alignment of observations could be achieved by altering the uh, original data using uh, data interpolation or the so-called calendarization techniques. Now, the calendarization process is a simple idea to begin with. Uh, I have my end of periods in uh, February, uh, May, August, and November every quarter. And I would like to produce data estimates for the standard quarters ending in March, June, September, and December. Now, the thing is working with estimates instead of actual data is uh, never an easy solution. Uh, I'd, I'd like to avoid that here. Uh, so I will concentrate my efforts on uh, the simple cross-sectional uh, model and use uh, momentum regressors to uh, remove potential autocorrelations in the error term. Uh, basically, you can refer to uh, the first chapters of Woolrich, um, a book entitled Econometrics of Cross-Sectional and uh, Panel Data. Uh, you'll find there a discussion of uh, the benefits of momentums in uh, improving the model specifications. Uh, by the way, a full bibliography is available uh, at the end of the documents. Now, Fama and French used annual data from the 10K findings uh, from uh, beginning of July to end of June to calibrate the model and predict one, two, and three years ahead uh, returns on equity. You can see here, predict the T plus one, T plus two, T plus three, forming an observation. Our calibration, on the other hand, is performed on every results announcement dates or a few business days later. Uh, <clears throat> now, whenever new information is acquired, uh, we are taking as a reference uh, the last uh, end of period available and moving backwards. This is the last end of period, and we're moving backwards to collect our data. 
and again, the predictive and predictive t plus one will form one observation, and so on. And these, these observations are used to calibrate our uh, cross-sectional model. Now, uh, <coughs> every newly acquired observation for one single firm will, will impact the calibration. Uh, so if it impacts the calibration, it will also impact our forecasts for all the other firms of our industry. This is the sequential learning property of the model. Now, once I have uh, my estimates for the cost of capital, I take an active long position on the highest uh, and a short active position on the lowest uh, ICCs. ICC uh, is meant for uh, implied cost of capital here. Uh, I choose to uh, test here uh, the ranking quality uh, for uh, 40 long positions and 40 uh, short positions against the realized returns. Uh, and to do so, I have rank correlations. Uh, one classic uh, ranking correlation is the, the Spearman uh, row, the first one mentioned here. We also have the Kendall Tau. Uh, basically, um, I'm assigning to the same uh, to, the, to the 41st ICCs the same uh, value of 40 plus 1 over 2, which is 20.5, uh, and I assign uh, the same rank on the 40 highest uh, ICCs. Sorry, uh, so 2 times n minus uh, 39 over 2. Uh, the highest correlation is reached 57% uh, uh, of the time within the first three months from the estimation. You can see here, uh, this is the daily uh, average uh, correlations that are at a peak when volatility is high in 2008 and here uh, 2000, 2011. The maximum uh, correlation uh, one more thing, this is the level of significance for a single uh, correlation, which is around 10%. Uh, it depends on the size of uh, your sample. Uh, here I have, this is a technology sector, so I have roughly um, uh, 300 uh, firms in, in my sample uh, after filtering. Now this is uh, the maximum cor correlation, which is reached uh, very often within the first 25 days at 15 to 20 percent. Uh, that's the correlation that, that we are looking to buy here. Uh, the strategy is mean reverting. So the higher the correlation, the better our hope to generate alpha. Uh, we are long correlations. Once the selection is done, we still need uh, market risk management framework. So here I have completed here the risk objective. Uh, I mentioned uh, small beta allocation, diversification, and specific risk control. Now the terms uh, small beta in small beta allocation cover a wide range of procedures. Uh, every problem that accounts for a measure of risk, uh, typically variance, volatility, and correlation, qualifies for many as uh, small beta. Um, I would have liked to catch your attention on some of the main challenges here for the uh, allocation, but I will have to, to pass because we, we're a little bit short of time. Uh, but uh, you can see here on this uh, uh, slide the backtesting results for the technology sector in dashed blue, uh, the NASDAQ technology uh, uh, index, um, the NDXT, is in dashed uh, uh, red, and in light blue, dark blue, and green, we have uh, the distribution of the cost of equity uh, capital. We can see in 2000, uh, normalized, of course, at, at zero. Now, uh, we can see in 2008 that the cost of capital have uh, reacted with uh, months of delay yeah. to the crisis. Uh, we, again, we cannot expect the model to forecast macroeconomic events, but we can hope, like in 2008 and 2011, that it would capture uh, and profit from uh, high volatility periods. Um, whenever we see uh, high, a high discrimination between stocks. Now, I have reported uh, here also, this is the last slide, a sector-neutral uh, 
uh, simulation on all uh, US names. Uh, it's a reachable target. Uh, it would be also interesting, maybe soon enough, to see how a long-only version uh, with the same sector weights as the classic benchmark uh, performs. Uh, the source he knows is, is, is decent, and, and the, the uh, drawdown is here to remind us what, that we are dealing with stocks. So always highly risky. Uh, it happens here uh, in the crisis. These are distributions per sector, liquidity, and capitalization. I will uh, let you uh, analyze that on your own. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, time is always uh, too short. And I hope this presentation gave you at least an idea of the uh, challenges of systematic uh, uh, management for equity shares. Uh, I will now answer any questions that you might have. Any questions? Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Well, it turns out uh, recently, recently. So. Yes. Basically, she's asking that uh, she's asking how uh, we could retrieve the uh, financial inf information from statements, uh, knowing that um, uh, I mean, basically it's. It's an exhaustive process. It seems like an exhaustive process, and it is, actually. But the thing is, uh, recently, uh, the SEC uh, asked for uh, the, the firms that, that were to report their filings to uh, add an XBRL file. XBRL, extensive business. So basically, uh, you can do it. It's possible. It's a lot of work. I've worked on it, but it's a lot of work. And you can actually uh, work on some uh, mappings. For, for any given firm, you will have mostly the same items you know, that we find in the, in the statements. So if you work on a, on a smart mapping, you can directly retrieve this information. Otherwise, you have providers uh, like um, um, Edgar, but uh, of course they they will uh, they will give you the information once you have the 10Ks or 10Q reports. There is always because the number of information we need, sorry, the number of variables we need is very limited. So you always have, especially for this model, uh, I need a dozen uh, of variables so I can uh, maximum add them manually once I have my 8K. Um, I hope this this is satisfying. Uh, any other question? No. no? I know it seems uh, extremely theoretical and can be very complicated for people who didn't uh, go into uh, into statistical models. Uh, I mean, I hope I gave you at least an idea of what we can achieve uh, here. Everything that I mentioned is, uh, is really inspired by the work of Fama and French and the work of uh, Gebhardt initially, but I, I pushed it towards uh, relative value. Um, it's not about getting an absolute level for the uh, equity premium, but getting a relative value uh, with respect to the same uh, stocks of, our, of, of an homogeneous universe. That's the idea. Well, I think this is very much CFA stuff, so uh, if that's not something that uh, we can play with or uh, understand, then I think we've done a problem. But, uh, let's give it a uh, break. By the way, I was, I was particularly pleased that you mentioned XBRL as well, the extensible business reporting language. Yes. Uh, I'm the president of the Swiss XBRL through restriction, so uh, that's okay. uh, one thing that uh, we should definitely push for, even though XBRL in Switzerland is, is uh, very much a, a back burner uh, issue due, due to the uh, uh, low key interest of issuers uh, who just see it as an additional potential obligation 
uh, at the stock exchange also is not really uh, very keen keen on uh, on uh, pushing for that because of that because stock exchange as you all know is a member organization and if some of their members actually push against that and see it as an obligation then they will also be uh, somewhat reluctant uh, to uh, to adopt it uh, so uh, thank, thank you very much that. that's great